as we come to Ephesians chapter number four this week, the middle part of the chapter, and week number eight uh, in this summer long series. Let me remind you, let's begin together with a reminder of the guiding principle that we have been learning since the very beginning of this series. It is this principle that says we are one because Jesus has made us one. Would you say that out loud with me? Let's affirm it together. We are one because Jesus has made us one. It's so important to me that you get this. We are one. We are unified not simply by strategy or by design or by ministerial priority or by emphasis. We are one by divine decree that Jesus has joined us together and made us one. And in the beginning of this series, as we were talking about unity or wholeness or completeness, and by the way, when the Bible uses the word unity, that's what it means, something that is complete or joined together, something that is whole, it's not fractured, it's not disjointed, it's not going apart, it's whole. When we began talking about this unity that God has called us to and created us for, we noticed the fact that this unity is, in fact, the very nature of God himself. God is one. He is unified. He is whole and complete. And we recognize this in light of the fact that we serve a triune God, right? We believe in the Trinity, that God exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And yet there is no division among them. There is no separation or fragmentation. This one God is a triune God, but he exists in perfect wholeness, in perfect completeness, and in perfect unity. And we also talked about the fact that when God, this perfectly unified and cohesive and one God, when he made the heavens and the earth, he created in six days a creation that was perfectly unified. Remember we talked about how that in creation, in the original creation, all things work together in perfect unity, perfect rhythm or syncopation. Remember, we talked about the earth and the sky and the land and the sea and the morning and the evening. We talked about the, the uh, man and beast and husband and wife and how that they all work together in perfect divine unity until they didn't. And they didn't after sin entered into creation through Adam and Eve's rebellion and it destroyed the unity that God had created. And so what had been perfect rhythm, perfect syncopation, perfect unity suddenly is broken apart. Suddenly following Genesis chapter number three and the sin of Adam and Eve, there is this division that happens. Thorns and thistles break forth and animals become a source of danger and the seas begin to rage. And even among the relationship that Adam had with Eve, they began to be separated. And so anger replaced unity and hatred replaced love and blame replaced uh, a perfect unity. All of this as the result of sin. Because God, when he is present, he brings unity. Now, by the way, this is uh, the fact that makes it true that everything that is moving toward God is moving toward unity. And everything that is moving away from God is moving toward chaos. This is always true. If you want to have unity in a relationship, let's say that you're in a relationship where there's some fragmentation, there's some brokenness, okay? That's true in a lot of relationships. I promise you, if you want to begin to bring healing to that, begin by stepping toward the Lord. If together you will begin stepping toward the Lord, you're moving toward unity. And wherever there is a fragmentation, Moving toward the Lord will bring unity. By the way, this is true in our nation, isn't it? Because we live in a divided nation. I mean, we're living in a time when, you know, our nation is more 
uh, divided, I think, than it's ever been, certainly in my lifetime, and it would seem uh, maybe in any time or most times in our history. We, we are a polarized nation. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if there would be a revival in America, a spiritual revival driven by repentance and faith? And I'll promise you, if that would happen, we would find our nation coming back together in so many ways. Because whatever moves toward the Lord is moving toward unity. Well, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve moved away from the Lord, and so that resulted in a destruction of unity. Now, what did God do when the unity of creation was broken by sin? Well, we know what he did. We've learned this in our previous weeks. He began to implement a plan of redemption. And the plan that he implemented was ultimately a plan to restore the unity of creation that had been broken because of sin. Do you remember this? Let me ask you to turn back one page, chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. And verse number 10 it says, here's, here's his purpose in Christ, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. In chapter one, verse 10, he says, here's my plan. I created unity and, and divine oneness it was destroyed by sin, and so I've sent Jesus into the world, and ultimately in the final redemption, he's going to restore all things to the unity that once existed. He's taken us back to Eden, ultimately. He's taking us back to this perfection of creation that sin has destroyed. Now, when we think about this unity that he is accomplishing through his redemptive plan, it will be fully realized in eternity but it is now being realized and demonstrated, displayed in the church. We are the ones who now are experiencing this redemption and this unity as a result of Christ. It is in Jesus. It's through his blood. It's in Christ that we are at one with God. It is in Jesus that we in relationships can have unity with one another. And so that unity is both vertical, we're at one uh, with God, and it is horizontal. We can be at one with one another as well. Now over the last three Sundays, the guys who have filled the pulpit, both here and at our campuses, have done a fantastic job of taking us through what Paul is teaching us in the book of Ephesians. Three weeks ago, Chris Owens did a fantastic job. I watched it uh, as I watched every week, but uh, Chris did a fantastic job teaching about God's revelation of the mystery. Remember that from the first part of chapter three? The mystery of God. This thing that God had been working throughout the ages but was only revealed in the time of Jesus and in the time of the apostle Paul that God would create a new entity, not Jew exclusively, not Gentile exclusively, but a new entity called the church made up of redeemed Jews and Gentiles and that there would be one, that mystery that God had planned. And then the next week, two weeks ago, Tim Brady here at North and our campus pastors on each campus, they did a fantastic job teaching us about how in unity we pray for one another and how that our prayers rightly focused will lead us to unity and that there is a strength that we experience when we are unified. And then thirdly, last week, Sullivan Brady did such a great job explaining from uh, the beginning of chapter 4, the walk of unity, how we walk out this unity together. I was so proud of Sullivan and his illustration of the marching band and the cadence. I love that, the cadence of our unity, that we walk in humility and in patience and in love. Today we're coming to the middle part of chapter four where we're going to learn together that every one of us, all of us individually, have been gifted individually and specifically for the purpose, for the cause of unity. In fact, I want you to see this in the text, and it's really important, but before we read it, I want you to see uh, in verse number three, look at chapter four, verse number three, where Paul writes, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Sullivan did a great job exegeting that verse and the, the ones around it last week and how that we are to seek to keep and to guard unity. 
But here's what I want you to see today, that not only are we responsible for guarding unity, what Paul's going to teach us today is that each one of us have been gifted, we have been given gifts that when we exercise them, they lead to about it, and that is that we are to help to create it in the Spirit as we exercise the gifts that he has given us. This is the message of Ephesians chapter 4 that we're going to see beginning in verse number 7. So I want you to follow along as I read, and then we'll talk about these things. Verse number 7 of Ephesians 4 says this, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of of the gift of Christ. And to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might feel or fulfill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints or the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we, henceforth, going forward, we should no more be like children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and their cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but rather... Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And from whom, or from Christ, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, it makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And all God's people said, amen. I want you to think with me about this passage today by writing down as we get started just this simple thing that I've already mentioned. It is that we are all gifted with responsibility. We are gifted with responsibility. Now, that's not to say that responsibility is the gift. We have been given gifts, spiritual gifts, And along with those gifts comes the responsibility that we would um, exercise those gifts that we have been given. It is a fundamental fact of the Christian faith, of the kingdom of God, that every single born-again believer, every Christian in whom the Spirit of God dwells, and by the way, that's every Christian. If the Spirit of God indwells you, you are a Christian, and if he doesn't, you are not. So in every single Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells and he has given to us spiritual gifts. And it's interesting, you can't miss the fact that this is stated in verse number four when he says, look at it in verse four, when he says that every one, uh, chapter number four, I'm sorry, verse seven, chapter four, verse seven, but unto every one of us is given this grace gift. You you can't miss that verse 4 follows verse 2, verse 3, where he talks about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one uh, hope, uh, one uh, uh, Savior, one Father. In those verses, he's talking community, community, community. It's we're all one. And then in verse 4, he goes, oh, and by the way, and individually, this is what you have. It's two verses of us, us, us. And then he goes, and you, 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 and me, and you, and you, and all you at the other campuses. All of you individually have been given spiritual gifts. 
And he teaches us in this passage that we are responsible, we are held accountable to exercise those gifts that we have been given. Now, what do you notice in these verses about these gifts? Look at verse number seven. I think it becomes plain in verse number seven that the gifts are given by Jesus himself. Verse seven, but unto every one of us is given grace or a gift of grace according to the measure of Christ. It is Jesus that gives us these gifts. He is the Lord of the church, right? And so he places within the church giftedness according to his plan so that the church exercising its gifts will look like it ought to look. It will be what it ought to be. It'll have the flavor that it ought to have. He gets to decide what gifts go where. I'm married to Tracy Dykes, otherwise known as Betty Crocker, in case you didn't know that. Tracy is a master baker, which is part of the reason I look the way that I do. But when she bakes and when she asks me to help her to bake, she is very precise in the measurements of what goes in that cake or whatever she's making. I mean, if it says a cup of this or a half a cup of that, she's not just dipping in that, in that jar, you know, flour or whatever, and just putting it in there. Oh, no. She's the Lord of the kitchen, right? She dips it. She packs it. She dips a little more. She packs it. She takes a knife and she levels it off because she gets to determine what are the ingredients in that cake that she's baking. And it is a blessing, I promise you. But just like Tracy determines what goes in the cake, according to the recipe, Jesus determines what goes into the church. He's the Lord of the church and he gives us these gifts according to his will. Now to neglect a gift, would you agree, is to dishonor the giver, isn't it? If I gave you a gift, it doesn't matter what I spent on it, a little bit or a lot, it doesn't matter. If I, if I bought you a gift or made something for you and I invested time and, and, and resource and I had you on my mind and then when I brought it home and I wrapped it up, everything, every moment I was wrapping it, I was thinking about the moment I would give it to you and how you would receive it and if you would like it and what you would think. And if I brought you that gift and I said, hey, I just wanna, I just wanna give you this gift. If you took that gift and you went, oh, okay, and you set it on the shelf and you went on about your day, do you think you would be dishonoring me? You, you would be saying, your gift isn't that important to me. I'll get to it later, maybe. And if you were saying that the gift that I gave you is not that important to me, isn't that really the same thing as saying, in a way, you're not really that important to me? You cannot disregard a gift without dishonoring the giver. And I know that wouldn't be our heart. I know that nobody under the sound of my voice this morning would ever want to dishonor Jesus. We love Jesus. We want to honor Jesus. But we must recognize that if Jesus has given us gifts, if we are not exercising those gifts to his honor, then we are in fact dishonoring the one who has given those gifts to us. And you would never want to dishonor him especially when you understand what it cost him to give you the gift. In fact, keep reading. Look at verse number eight. He says in verse number seven, God has given to all of us gifts, or Jesus has given to all of us gifts. Verse eight, this is why he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is why he said, when he ascended up on high. Where did he say that? Psalm 68 and verse 18. This is a quote from Psalm 68, 18, which is a messianic psalm whereby Jesus is speaking about his ascension and his giving of these spiritual gifts. Now, verses 9 and 10 are very important in this passage because these verses in verses 9 and 10 are a parenthetical a couple of verses where Paul almost steps aside and says, now let me explain to you what this means. When, it, when he says he ascended to give you these gifts, let me say this again. In verse number eight, Paul says, Jesus ascended and then he gave you gifts. You could not receive your spiritual gifts had Christ not ascended back to the right hand of God. He ascended and then he gave gifts. And then he explains, verse number nine, look at it, so important. 
Now, what is it when we say he ascended, but that we are affirming that he also, first of all, descended into the lower parts of the earth? He's saying the ascension of Jesus presupposes the descending of Jesus, that Jesus descended into the lowest parts of the earth. What does that mean? In John chapter number three, you know that verse, that passage, uh, Nicodemus says to Jesus, Master, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do the things that you're doing except God be with him. And in that chapter, in in that conversation, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I have come down from heaven. I have descended from heaven. He's speaking of his descending to the lowest parts of the earth. In fact, Paul in Philippians explains it more fully. Would you mind to turn two pages to Philippians chapter two? You're right there at it. Philippians chapter two, look at verse seven. Now verse six says that Jesus is God. But verse seven tells us, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus said, I have descended from heaven. Paul explains that descending or that condescension when he says, he laid aside his glory and he came and took on the form of a man. And then he began to be God's servant for us. I've told you before, in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. Where is Jesus baptized? In the Jordan River. Where is the Jordan River? In the Jordan Valley. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan Valley, right where the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. It is, geographically speaking, listen carefully, the lowest point on planet Earth. It is the lowest point below sea level of any place on the planet. He came from heaven, became a man, went to the lowest point on planet earth, the lowest point below sea level, and he was baptized. And he was baptized under the muddy waters of the Jordan River, taking his identification with your sin and my sin. He was baptized, then he came up and he walked into his ministry three years later, he's nailed to a cross where he bears your sin and my sin. Naked, hanging on a cross in humiliation and pain and suffering, he is crucified. And as if that is not low enough, then they take his body and they put it in a cold, damp, stone tomb like every other sinner since Adam had been laid in a tomb. They take the high exalted son of God and they lay him in a tomb. He has come from the heights of heaven and descended now until he has not only become a man and a servant and identified with our sin and taken our sin and paid for our sin and now he's laying in a tomb for our sin. And 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 would intimate to us that while his body laid in the tomb, his spirit went even into hell itself. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul says he ascended to give you gifts. But when he ascended, we're saying that he first of all descended into the lowest parts of the earth. If y'all understand, shout amen. You would never want to dishonor the giver of gifts, when you realize that the gifts that he has given you have come to you because of his condescending, all that he suffered and endured, and then his ascending back to the right hand of God. But look at verse number seven again. It says in verse number seven of Ephesians chapter four that he took captivity captive. What does that mean? He took captivity captive. It means that when he rose from the dead, he took that one final enemy of the human family, death, that had held the human family captive since Adam. In the day that you eat thereof, God said in Genesis 3, you shall surely die, or Genesis 2. You shall surely die. And they ate of it and they died. And from that time, Paul says in Romans 5 that that death reigned from Adam 
captivity, death had held us in fear and in bondage. And yet Jesus went to the lowest parts of the earth. He paid the penalty of our sin. He rose from the dead, took death captive itself and rose in victory. Now he sits far above all kings, far above all kingdoms, highly exalted in heaven, and he is the one who has taken death captive, and now he has given gifts to us. The spoils belong to the victor. And so Jesus, having taken the victory, taken captivity captive, he ascended, and he now gives us gifts. And by the way, I would just say to you that the gifts that you have been given, the spiritual gifts that you have been given are to be exercised in the face of Satan himself who would have held you captive forever and dragged you to hell. But Jesus defeated him, took death captive, defanged him, and then gave you gifts and said, rather than living in bondage to him, you go live in these gifts in the victory that I've offered you in Jesus. That's what he's done. And so the giver, the giver must be honored because he has paid a great cost for the gifts that he has given us. Beginning in verse number 11, when he talks to us about this, these gifts that he has given, he begins to to list, to delineate those gifts. He begins to speak to us about the purpose, write that down somewhere, the purpose of these gifts. Now, when we think about the gifts, Verse number 11 mentions uh, four or five, rather, five gifts. He lists the gift of apostleship in the early church and prophets, the gift of prophecy and the gift of evangelism and the gift of shepherding of pastors and the gift of teaching. But those aren't the only gifts listed in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 mentions some gifts as well, spiritual gifts. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12 about gifts of wisdom and knowledge, gifts of faith, and discernment, and others. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul lists gifts of service and leadership, the gift of giving, gifts of mercy and hospitality, and more. When you, when you take all of the passages in the New Testament that teach us about spiritual gifts, you'll come up with a list of spiritual gifts, depending on how you count, of somewhere around 14, maybe 16 or 17, maybe a little more depending on what gifts you might say are, are um, active in the church today and others that aren't. But you'll find a list or you'll, you'll create a list of spiritual gifts that God has given to us within the church today. We'll talk about those gifts later, but... But let me just focus our attention on why the gifts were given. I asked you to write down the purpose of spiritual gifts. Verse 12, I want you to circle in verse number 12 three things, three, three words or parts um, of, these, of this sentence in verse number 12. Will you circle the word uh, the saints? Do you see that in verse number 12? The saints. And then in verse 12, you'll see the ministry. So the saints, the ministry, and then the body the body of Christ. When you pay attention to those three phrases, the saints, the ministry, and the body of Christ, here's what becomes clear about the purpose of spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts that God has given to you and me are not for us. They are for the saints. They are for the ministry. They are for the body. No person has ever been given spiritual gifts for our own edification or our own enjoyment. They are given to us so that we might serve others through those gifts. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit, that is the gifts of the Spirit, are given to each one of us for the profit of all. The gifts that we've been given are for the benefit of others. And so he says in verse number 12 that we have all been given gifts so that we can all be a part of helping other believers, other saints, to be matured. Do you see it in verse 12? The perfecting. It means the maturing or the completing of the saints. You and I play a part in one another's spiritual maturation. We help one another to mature by using, by exercising our gifts. I need you, I need you to exercise your gifts so that I can become all that God wants me to be. 
And you need me to exercise my gifts so that you can become all that God wants you to be. And we all need one another exercising our individual gifts so that we can all become what God wants us to be, the maturing of the saints. He goes on to say, for the work of the ministry. It's perfectly placed in the passage because in order to do the work that God has called us to, we must be mature. (laughs) You cannot send a child to do an adult's work. You can't send a boy to do a man's job. You cannot send a girl to do a woman's task. And so if we're going to do the work as a church that God wants us to accomplish, we must be mature. And how are we going to grow to maturity? As we all exercise our spiritual gifts. And then he says in verse number 12, thirdly, for the edifying, means the building up or the strengthening of the body of Christ. Now I want you to think about the amazing And the weighty responsibility that we've all been given when it comes to these spiritual gifts. That that, that the way that I, the way that you, the way that we exercise our gifts will determine as a whole the effectiveness, the maturity, the impact of our church. How we as a church accomplish what God wants us to accomplish is dependent in large part on how we as individual members of this church exercise our spiritual gifts. Now let me answer a question that some of you may be asking right now, which is, well, I don't know where to exercise my gifts. What what, what does that look like? Where do I do it? Well, let me give you some suggestions, okay? Uh, One would be in your life group. In fact, I would say that this is the best place for any Christian to exercise their spiritual gifts. If you only sit in a service with hundreds of other people, then exercising your spiritual gifts might be difficult in that setting sometimes. But if you are in a gathering of 8 or 10 or 12 or 20 that you do life with and that you love and they love you, it's in that kind of fellowship that each one of you can exercise your spiritual gifts. And so if you're not in a life group, you should be because that's the place where you can help others grow to maturity primarily. You can do it on serve teams as well. Many people here serve, hundreds of people here serve every week and they're exercising spiritual gifts and doing that. You can do it on a serve team. You can do it with a community partner that we can connect you with. You can do it on a prayer team. We can help you find a place, but you must step in in order to exercise those gifts that God has given you. And in fact, this is, this is the point at which I would just challenge all of you um, going forward. Because one of the, and you've heard me pound the pulpit about this before, but you know, one of the things that I love about technology is that when we are homebound or when we're sick or when we're out of town, we have the opportunity to still be a part of worship by tuning in online. Tracy and I were going the last three Sundays. We worshiped with you every single one of those Sundays because of the online live streaming. Praise God for it. I was very grateful for that. And if you're sick or you're shut in, then that's a wonderful tool. But we live in a time when the temptation is more and more and more to believe that I can be a part of the church by having the habit of just tuning in online. If y'all are listening, shout amen. I know some of y'all think, here he goes again. I'm sorry. It's the world we're living in. I'm really not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. (laughs) But the way, the the world we're leaning in, living in is we lean toward all my content comes digitally. I'm just going to kind of sit home and get get it that way. I, I just have to tell you, I love you enough to tell you, if your habit, and I'm not talking about sick, I'm not talking about traveling, I'm not talking about shut in, but if your habit is to become, if it ever becomes, and I'm talking to you in front of me, If your habit ever becomes, I'm just going to watch at home online, that's my habit, rather than being a part, it is the 21st century version of selfish Christianity. Because it says it's all about what I can just sit and receive at no cost to me, not even brushing my teeth. I can just receive it. I don't have to serve the body of Christ. I know, I came back after three weeks just mean as a snake, right? But listen, this is important for us, that we have to be in a position to serve our church family. And for those of you who are shut in and you can't come and you're watching online today and you say, I can't be there because I'm shut in or I don't live there, then there are gifts that can be operated when that is the case. 
But we have to understand that we can't be selfish and serve. Now, let me finally, and, and to close, uh, just show you from this passage, lastly, the unifying power of spiritual gifts. Because we're talking about unity, and, and we recognize that, that Paul is teaching us that we all have these responsibilities, these spiritual gifts that we've been given, and that as we exercise them, there is a power of unity that happens. Uh, he, he makes it clear in this passage, beginning in verse number 13, that when we exercise our spiritual gifts individually, something amazing occurs. Look at this. Verse number 12, here's the purpose. I've given you gifts for the perfecting of the saints, work of the ministry, edifying of the body. Verse 13, till we all come or we arrive in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or a mature man reaching the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He says, here's what happens in your church. That when, as a church, we all begin to operate in our spiritual gifts and we're building one another, maturing one another in the faith, helping one another grow, he says, we're going to reach this place where we're all unified, watch this, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. He says that we're building one another up. So here's the way I would say it. Verse 13 promises this. As we all exercise our spiritual gifts, we will all know him as one. We will all trust him as one. We will all love him as one because we are building one another up in him. Another way to say that would be to say we are one because he has made us one. And he continues to make us more and more one as we exercise those gifts. He says, as we do that, this beautiful thing happens, verse number 14, as we are maturing, we're knowing him as one and trusting and loving him as one, growing to this mature uh, church. He says in verse 17, so then henceforth, after, as that happens, we will no longer act like children, tossed to and fro, in one day, out the next day, hot one day, cold the next day, sure faith one day, no faith the next day, serving him one day, not serving him the next day. No, we'll stop acting like children. And we will begin to act like adults, strong, mature men and women of God. And what does that look like? Verse number 15, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is uh, into the head, which is Christ. And then you come to verse 16. Let me read verse 16 again. From whom, Christ is the head, from whom, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <laughs> Y'all know I love my King James translation, right? But if there was ever a poster child verse for a more modern translation, that's it right there. So let me show you the more modern translation on the screen. It's the same verse, but it's in the English Standard Version. Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying that when we do this, then the whole body will be held together by what? By that which every one of us is bringing. By that which every joint supplies when every part is working properly. When we're all exercising our gifts for the benefit of one another, loving him and loving one another, then we will make the body to be this church which will build itself up in love. How do we get there? As we exercise the giftedness that he's put within each one of us. And when we're joined together in that way and when we're exercising our gifts in that way and when we're loving one another and speaking the truth in love and walking in mature fellowship, no longer like children, then he's saying to us that the local church becomes this beautiful, strong, loving force for grace in a dark world. I implore you, walk in your giftedness and serve your church with those spiritual gifts. Now I need to tell you, that for some of you, to do that is going to require you to die to some things that you've been holding on to. And one of the things that it might require you to lay down is a sense of fear and hesitation that it's driven by former hurts. Because in order to live like this, you're going to have to say, I trust Jesus and I'm going to serve you. I'm just going to love him 
and I'm going to love you. I'm just going to live my life and exercise my gifts for the benefit of others. And some of you are thinking, you know what? I've tried that before and I got hurt and I, I was willing to serve and I got stepped on or, or I was disappointed or whatever. And you're just going to have to get over that and say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to love him and I'm going to serve others. And so my question to you is, are you willing to do that? Do you trust him enough to live your life in, a, in an abandoned sort of way for other people? Years ago, I came across um, an illustration of this point that I think is so fitting. You've, some of you have heard it before. It's been a number of years, though, but I've shared it with you in the past. But it, is, it, it illustrates so beautifully this, um, this truth that I've just got to trust Jesus. I've got to let him lead, and I'm just going to be the servant that he wants me to be to those around me. It's called the bicycle story. Let me read it to you. I used to think of God as my observer my judge, keeping track of the things that I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I died. He was out there, sort of like a president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I didn't really know him. But later on, when I met Jesus, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride, but it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that Jesus was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested that we trade places, but life has never been the same since. When I was in control, I uh, knew the way. It was rather boring, but it was predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took control, he knew delightful long cuts, up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on. And even though it looked like madness, he would say, just pedal. I was worried and I asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer. And that's when I learned to trust him. I forgot my boring life and I entered into every adventure. And when I'd say I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing and acceptance and joy. And they gave me their gifts to take on my journey. And he'd say to me, give your gifts away as well. They're too heavy. And so I did. I gave gifts to people that we met. And I found that in giving, I received and still our burden was light. I didn't trust him at first to be in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets. He knows how to take the sharp corners and jump over high rocks. And I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful companion, my Lord Jesus. And when I'm sure I just can't do it anymore, he smiles and says, just pedal.